Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to another in our series of uh, 175th anniversary alumni lectures. It gives me great pleasure to welcome a uh, very distinguished panelists this evening and also to thank the sponsors of the event, Erwin Mitchell. And I will first of all introduce James, who is partner and head of rural business and estates practice, who are kindly sponsoring the event. And James acts for landed estates, trustees and private individuals. He's clearly the man you need to know if you need to get yourself out of any trouble because he specializes in resolving difficult issues such as trust, property and land use issues, whether in judicial review proceedings before the Supreme Court or behind closed doors or at any spectrum on the, in between that. He is a member of the CLA's Legal, Parliamentary and Property Rights Committee and a past president of Cambridge University Land Society. James, thank you very much for chairing this evening and it proves to be something very interesting, I think. Lord Bathurst, you all will know because of his close links with the Royal Agricultural University, being an alumnus, not so many years ago, I think, is it Alan, very recent alumnus. And of course, he's also uh, one of our vice presidents and, and really is, uh, I, I can't thank him enough for how supportive he is at the university. He owns the Balthus Estate in Siren Sister Park, an estate that's over 300 years old and as well as park and farmland has extensive woodlands. It is renowned for having the world's largest tall, huge yew hedge, which is an incredibly prominent feature in Siren Sister as the estate sits rather unusually within the town and Lord Bathurst is very involved in local community life. Victoria, it's always a great pleasure to meet you as well. Victoria's home in Cornwall. I hope I'm going to pronounce this correctly, but coming from Wales, I should be able to, shouldn't I? Because we have many similarities in our, in our dialects. Is Tre Trailer Warren, and it's a diversified rural family business with a strong ecological focus. The business includes some tenanted and some in-hand agricultural land, a lowland heath restoration project, woodland, a tourism business, and off-site building projects. Victoria is vice president of the CLA, where she also chairs the policy committee, which is clearly a very critical role at the moment, and sits on the Natural Capital Project and the Access Working Group. William Fry, another member of the panel, is managing director and co-owner of Rural Solutions. Rural Solutions is a professional services business made up of a multidisciplinary team of consultants, planners, architects and landscape architects. They have specialised for over 20 years in delivering sustainable and responsible development in the rural, leisure, tourism, commercial and residential and hospitality sectors. I think we can look forward to a really interesting evening. And it's just coincidental that I have just given a talk on global challenges in land use to my old school because they have a very similar alumni event. And um, I, in a weak moment, I don't know what got me to do it, said I would speak about this global challenge of land use. But I was very lucky to be able to use the experience I've gained from hearing about the amazing innovations on UK escapes to talk about the, the, the real changes that we're seeing and the innovations that we're seeing. And that's largely thanks to the fact that we do have these large estates in the UK, which are handed down through generations. And they are, I don't know whether that's the right word, hotbeds of innovation, which means that land use change is able to take place quite rapidly sometimes and to adapt to the to challenges that we face like now are over Brexit. So James, over to you and thank you again for sponsoring this evening. Okay, thank you very, very much indeed for, for your, your warm welcome. It's, it's, we've been collaborating with the, with the Royal Agricultural University, I think now for, for over a couple of years, and it's, it's been an, an absolute pleasure and, 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 and very insightful for us as, as, as a business, and, and particularly a business where we're very committed to, to, to the rural sector. Um, we've called this evening's um, 
I suppose, pan panel discussion, and, and, and there'll hopefully be plenty of opportunity for, for Q&A. And, and I think if you do put questions into the, in, into the box, we may actually call upon you to, 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 to ask them of us live. Um, but we've called it in the States, why do we do what we do? And to give you a bit of a heads up, I'm, I'm going to talk primarily with Lord Bathurst and Victoria really from the sort of the point of view of the insight of the estate owner um, to start off with. And then William, in, in, in terms of the sort of the context of actually using the sort of the, the question, actually, what, what do you do on succession in a generation? Just to think about actually what mark one can make, what, what one can you know, be thinking about doing to, to, you know, within one's own tenure and custodianship of a, of a landed estate. And then we'll come on to the sort of the bigger picture of the rather exciting exciting decade of flux that I think we're, 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 we're facing. But it, I thought it might just help to give the insight of the why do we do what we do, sort of the existential question, why, why I suggested this as being something which might be interesting. And I, I remember sitting about three, four years ago at a, an estate meeting, and I'd been taken along by a, a very much more senior partner of, of my, my firm as, as his sort of retirement successor, as the lawyer to, to help the estate. And I was pitched into the, the middle of a very, very angst-ridden conversation, um, lawyers, accountants, about sort of, you know, bringing, bringing the, 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 the whole tax structural issues, and, you know, from some historic tax planning, bringing everything back on shore. And about an hour and a half into this, this very, very angsty conversation, I thought, do I really pluck up the courage to ask, ask the question that I really wanted to ask? And I thought, okay, let's, let, let's go for it. And, and I said, well, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? Why, you know, what, 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 is, what is this all about? And it looked rather sort of strange. I, thought, I think it's always quite important to ask, ask that existential question. Why are we in the business of, of running you know, an estate, but particularly this estate? And I got the answer that I thought I was going to get, which is actually, it's a, it's a good answer and it's a solid answer, which is we've been here for 800 years and I don't want to be the one, my generation, to drop the ball. And of course, that's that's you know that is part of the right answer. It's part of the right answer because if you don't get that sort of you know that 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 sense of sort of you know belonging, commitment, and custodianship, then you know the, the, you know there won't be the desire to the the, you know, the the will to go and, and fix the problems on the roof or be there seven days a week and open up to the public when you know when 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 when, when that is that is what needs to be done. But it also felt like a slightly sort of partial answer, a slightly sort of pessimistic answer. And I didn't ask the question that I wanted to as a sort of supplementary one, which was, was you know, but I mean, you know, what, what, is, what is your special focus for, for, for your custodianship, your tenure? What, you know, what exciting plans you've got? And, and why does this feel, you know, really as though it's a sort of, you know, it's a generational millstone around your neck? And I certainly didn't ask the question which was going through my mind at that point, was, you know, wouldn't it be just much, much easier to sell all the real property assets pay as little tax as you can get away with, go and live in a perfectly nice house, which doesn't have an acre of, of roof with holes in it that you need to worry about, um, and, and live off the, the income. And, and that's the sort of the reverse of the why do we do what we do question. But I, I, might, I, should, I, I think we'll start with that. I'm going to build that actually in Victoria's direction. We'll start, we'll start with, the, with, the, with, the, with the slightly puckish question, which is actually, why don't you and, and, and your husband at times, it, there may there may have been moments where you, you, it's gone through your minds that actually you think you know maybe we should just just you know this is all too frustrating. But but what keeps you going? What gets you up in the morning? Well, there's two sides to that. The, the 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 puckish answer to the puckish question is we've often thought about it and then we've just thought, oh God, but who'd buy it? You know, so uh, <laughs> so that that's where that's where we were. Um, in 75 years ago, um, my husband's great aunt Clara, who was a, a quite well known writer. So when she came back to live at Trelaw Warren after the war, it was nothing but rats, ruin, and death duties. And, um, and, and, and although when I came in 1995, it, it was better in terms of um, the death duties, uh, the, the rats continue to make themselves felt and, and, and the ruin abounds around us. So there has to be some pleasure in what you're doing. And sometimes the steps forward that you're making are not visible to other people they're only visible to you. So, um, you know, we, small triumphs, which were seen off stage, like being able to take back our Agricultural Holdings Act tenancy and bring the farm back into our own control, um, being able to buy back the standing timber 
uh, on the in the forestry, which had because was belonged to the forestry commission and the, those that came after them. That those sort of things, and finally managing to get the main part of our house back from a charity which had had it on a peppercorn rent, mm. might seem for some people to just be making our problems worse. But actually, they bring back the whole picture for us and, and, and make it seem worthwhile. Don't be expecting hot bath water, is what I'd say to everybody, or at least only one a day. Uh, don't expect the windows to close and, and find the special smile on your face for somebody who says, there is water coming through on the top landing, you know. Yes, I do know. Uh, do you want me to go up now? It's dark. Um, and the fact that right now it's beautiful sunshine, I've just had a brisk argument with my husband about whether or not to mow the orchids on the lawn. And, and it seems like a, a good place to be. Not always comfortable, but a good place to be. Lord Bathurst, do you, do you, do you recognise that description? I recognise an awful lot of that. And I think that because the ancestors have uh, struggled hard in many cases to uh, make the estate work, uh, particularly during the First and Second World Wars, and... Uh, I think in some ways we're almost in uh, quite easy times in comparison, but saying that, um, that life is not necessarily that easy for large estates, particularly with uh, uh, some of the uh, taxation that's, uh, that's there, but it's nothing like what it was in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, saying that, I think that we want to, well, my ambition certainly is to try and hand things on in a better state than I inherited them in the first place. Now, I should just be clear about that when I say inherited, um, that we have a fairly complicated set of different trusts set up, uh, which is obviously they're designed to protect the estate to a certain extent, but with it become uh, various other problems which we can or can't go into later on. And so that was really my sort of driving thing is to try and hand it over in better condition than I inherited it, in, if I can use that word inherited. Mm. That's what I think the driving ambition is, is there. And how, how did you come to it? I mean, was it, was it a succession of, of eldest son to eldest son to eldest son? And, and did you get a lot, of, a lot of sort of advanced warning and an opportunity to, to, to train for it, I suppose? Uh, it has largely been that, although we skipped a generation because my grandfather was killed in the Second World War, so it moved straight on to my father, who was a miner at the time. And then he set up trusts in the 60s. And uh, from there, there were various different beneficiaries and you know, we're gonna get complicated, which we probably don't want to just at this stage. Um, and so, yes, it's gone through that. And then I'm looking to try and move things on and have moved an awful lot on to my son, whom I believe is uh, listening at the moment, trying to make the best use of the inheritance tax um, that's, uh, that are available at present. And Victoria, I mean, did, did you did you come to it from a from a similar background, or was was this something you had to had to learn, if I could put it that way? Well, um, I certainly come from a very rural background. Mm -hmm. I grew up on Dartmoor, um, so my husband married out, uh, as with he's from Cornwall. Quite unusual, but you need to do it every now and then. Um, and um, so, yes, in the respect of being used to living a rural life and certainly in respect of, of living in cold and drafty houses, but I think neither of us had been, we weren't particularly properly prepared. He just finished a short service commission in the army and I just completed my history degree. So obviously we were perfectly suited for uh, and trained for coming to, to, to run Trevor Warren and, and his father was a bit older, so he wanted to retire straight away but we had all of the advantages of the thick skin of being 23 and 21 and, and thinking we could probably conquer the world. It turned out to be an awful lot more difficult, I think, than we expected. Um, but we have been able to pursue our individual interests and uh, particularly in environment and the ecology of the estate and, uh, uh, and just generally having a almost a platform for developing the things that became our interests. And I mean, Lord Bathurst has said that actually I think his, his father in the 60s put a lot into trust. I mean, are you grappling with you know, some of the estate in sole ownership, some in trust, some in an estate company? Or how, 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 how is Trello Warren held? Um, they, the, the Vivians take a certain amount of, of mistaken pride, I think, in the fact that they've, they've never put anything in trust except for, um, I think, um, 
Richard Rawlins and Vivian uh, had the estate and trust because he was a minor. Um, and that has strengths and weaknesses. The person who takes it on, takes it on, warts and all. Uh, their, their, their hands are not tied. If they are feckless and improvident, and all families have feckless and improvident people, uh, maybe our children will look back on us as those people, uh, then, then things uh, shrink away and then, then people work very hard and stop putting them back together again. But there are outside factors uh, as well. Um, Trello Warren suffered particularly badly in the First World War by having the double generation, uh, mm. two sets of de death duties, which left them in a really terrible state by the end of the 20s. Um, so, uh, and, as we, and sometimes, uh, you know, the, it has moved sideways as it did then um, because uh, Courtney Vivian died without children in 1942. But on the whole, um, I think they enjoy the prospect of having having the whole thing uh, such as it is. It it's like everything, it grows and it shrinks. You know, if you asked us what we wanted most in the world, what the one thing we'd get into more debt for, even now, would be the opportunity to buy land. And I, I think that's probably true of a lot of people. And in terms of, of uh, you, you mentioned having had the opportunity to, to, to to pursue projects, if I can use that word, that actually have interested you. I mean, what, what, have, what have been the highlights? Well, currently, uh, we have, uh, we've, we're just sort of completing a, a benchmarking biodiversity project with Exeter University, which has been very interesting about uh, setting six um, transects across Trello Warren to look at, uh, to do quite thorough biodiversity searches over the period of two or three years. And it's taught us, I mean, up on this piece, the lowland heath restoration, it's quite remarkable, the growth in biodiversity over nine years. It started looking like the Somme and, and now is a remarkable place. Um, but at the same time, if one of the transects is out in the middle of a field of silage, you learn quite quickly that it's a desert. There's nothing out there at all. Yeah. So, so I think we've all become very excited about land management, biodiversity issues. Lord Bathurst, I mean, it, it, have you had particular projects that you've pursued and you've wanted to pursue and you've been able to pursue, or, or actually have you had frustrations? You know, you, you, the, the various things, you, you know, you, on, on your watch, if I can put it colloquially, you, you would like to have done, but the, the circumstances haven't yet actually conspired to allow you to do. Yes, I think there certainly are frustrations or things that one hasn't been able to do. And I think that one of the issues about trusts is that they are on the whole sort of risk averse and that maybe taking the slight risk here or there or experiment here or there um, has not necessarily been possible. Um, but there are some exciting projects that we've uh, moved forward through. And again, it's the biodiversity ones that come through. And it's marvellous to see the orchids if uh, Victoria hasn't gone and mown them coming through in various uh, fields which you've left. Um, <laughs> And the different wildlife, and I've seen a lot more uh, butterfly orchids coming through in the place. I've never seen them this year, and it's it's lovely to see. We've got uh, different birds of prey turning up as well, and um, so there's re there really is quite a lot going on. And your employer, your the, the estate is is you know, I mean is is is, is there in, in the Sirens Nest? I mean, perhaps I put it this way. I mean, how how do you? I mean, your your, your role in the local community, your role for the local community how do, how do you how do you how do you feel that how how would you articulate that i think in many ways that um, all estates should have a role within the rural community now being in sarancester we are very much in the community um, and i pick up bits and pieces going on just as the fourth earl bathurst did uh, back in uh, 1845 with the setting up of the uh, royal agricultural college at the time and uh, the family has always felt very close to the uh, community um, in uh, enabling people to use the park, uh, walking and riding in it um, for free. And that's carried on right the way down through the generations. And when you walk around the town and get to know a little bit about the history, it's amazing how many things have been given to the town by the family over the years. So I, I think it's a very important part of uh, a role as a uh, as a major landowner and a state owner within the within the community, Victoria, is, is Trello Warren sort of you know backed into into a village in in, in Cornwall, or are, are you in glorious isolation? You know, you, uh, the Cornish are notoriously clannish, so their whole community is the nation state. 
that is Cornwall in, in the first place. And, and just for a slightly different glance, I think one community that uh, uh, the Cornish feel very strongly about is the one that's associated with what happens under the ground. Uh, that so the mineral estate is 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 there and is very much of interest to everybody at the moment with uh, the growth and interest in lithium, which is held in brine in the mines and real potential of, of reopening mines in in um, Camborne and and that opens up some has the potential to open up friction between the older not old in age but the older Cornish community and people who, who want to be in Cornwall and don't associate it with its very industrial past. Mm. Um, uh, so the planning permissions for, for reopening the mines are relatively contentious, although obviously there are a lot of um, a very thorough processes now to make it a, a, green, a greener interest. So, so I think there's a, there's a big historical community in Cornwall. People feel very attached to each other uh, not just within um, within their kind of local village communities, although somebody will always tell you if they're from um, Helston or Port Leven or if they're from Penzance or Newlyn, it makes a difference. <laughs> Indeed, and presu presuming last year, this year, a, a good time to be running running a holiday business or their let business in, in Cornwall. Yes, I think the COVID kindness dividend has been spent, mm. judging by last weekend. <laughs> um, so... Uh, um, Everybody was frightfully nice to each other last year. We could not do enough to help each other out. And, and there's been a little bit of the uh, rearing of, 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 of crossness going on. But, but actually, it, it's, it's been a pleasure to be the place where people, finally, when they were let out last year, could go to. You know what? You know, they, people were just so delighted. Some people said, what on earth do we do? We always go to Italy. What do we do in Cornwall? And I said, well... I think it's kind of a thermos flask and the beach this year. <laughs> Not a lot of high living. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I followed exactly that path and went fishing at the Arundel Arms, and I appreciate that, that is that is the other side of the Tamar, and and went went bodyboarding for the first time, which delighted my eleven year old daughter, and it was an absolutely absolutely fabulous fabulous holiday. I mean, just I mean, do, do, are you expecting? I mean, e even if the um, the, the sort of you know, the, the, a certain amount of this might might have been spent. I mean, are, are you are you expecting twenty twenty two to 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 see see similar amounts of interest? Oh, I I I mean, twenty twenty one is a, a short year because of course we didn't open until April twelfth, yeah. but we are booked pretty much solid to the end of October. I think people are kind of longing to go abroad. I mean, some people keep telling me, you know, it's going to be like this for five years, and my cautious nature tells me. Um, to, uh, to, to, to be prepared for everything to start dropping back over the next two or three years, depending on how many, you know, whether or not people go on holiday. Yeah. yeah. I think turning then to, to, the, to the second thing I wanted to, to discuss, and, 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 and William, I'm going to address this, this to you. Coming back to the, what, why do we do what we do? I mean, you, probably above, above, above anybody I, I know as, as a fellow professional, uh, you know, will we'll be called upon to, to, to you know to answer the very precise question. You've got you've got a, a generational change on an estate. You've got the enthusiasm. You've got the naivety, perhaps the you know, everything that sort of you know, is 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 there to be to be harnessed. You know, coming in, in into taking on the burden. You know, you're confronted. You're sitting sitting at that meeting. It, what are, what are, what are the what are the, the prime considerations? What are you what, what are you what are you going to sort of you know, lead off off on in terms of managing expectations, in terms of of, of helping people to 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 actually realise a, a, a you know a, a plan that is achievable, but that also doesn't suffer from 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 that that point of, of sort of pessimism, as I put it, that actually you know yeah. that, that does inspire people. Thanks, James. Um, good evening, everybody. I think it's every case is different and and there are people that come to us are people have blank sheets of paper we, we we need to do something we feel we need to do something we have people clients come to us that have already put their toe in the water and and and, and done a few things um, and others that already have established businesses and want to think about how they sustain that business going forward or perhaps change adapt, add on I think, particularly in succession, one of the, 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 the key burdens that people feel is we want to start the process of diversification. 
and I've just taken over and I've got to show that I can do it. I've got to put the, I've got to put the ball quickly in the back of the net. So I think our job is, is actually to try and manage that thinking and to create a roadmap in terms of what order you think about things and how you approach things. And often that anxiety is not only through that willingness and, and that keenness to be successful, but it's also a little bit around, goodness, we've missed the boat. We've not diversified and everybody else has. And, you know, there are eight farm shops in the local area. What, what, what are we going to do? And I think that there are a number of ways of actually looking at diversification. But I think the starting point is, is to say, actually, lucky thing, lucky you, you haven't diversified yet. Because I've been involved in diversification development in the countryside for 20, 22 years. And I think that those that haven't diversified and that are now looking to diversify, we know so much more about what is good, what works and what doesn't work in the countryside. So there is a body of evidence and a level of information available that simply wasn't available to people 20 years ago. And, 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 and just to a large extent, 20 years ago, people uh, lived by the mantra of builders and they will come. Ho hopefully it'll work. Whereas now we can make m far more informed decisions. So helping people to understand that to some extent they're in a quite fortunate position because yes, you can go and do something really new, something that others haven't done before, but you mustn't forget what you can also do is go and do what somebody else is already doing, but perhaps doing it badly. The beauty of that of course is that there's already an established market. So there is an opportunity. So I think it's really keen to let for people to try and understand what they want out of it. And, and the word that I hear from Victoria several times, and I think it's absolutely right, is enjoyment. And I think key to this is enjoyment. You have to be doing something that you, you want to do that is of interest to you. It's going to get you up in the morning with some energy and say, right, let's, let's go and deliver this next bit today. And I think if you if if if, if you have that, it will it, it will help you in your um, um, your progress. And Rome wasn't built in a day. It, it takes it takes time. And some of these really successful businesses, diversification business, some have taken decades to get to where they are. So I think it's really about taking stock, holding back, and saying, right, what do we want? What are our objectives? Does it have to be transformational or are we just looking for some gentle income streams? What's the journey we want to go on? And in terms of, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't want to focus on the negative, but I mean, in, ter I mean, in, term, in terms of this, this sector, but particularly when we're dealing with inherited estates, you know, and it may be maybe from many, many generations of ownership. I mean, are there particular sort of barriers psychologically to it that, that, that you find you're having to get help people to overcome I mean it is the fact that it is it is it's an inherited family business something you're acutely conscious of in terms of, of those conversations um, and, I mean I no doubt you will find yourself involved in family diplomacy at some point I mean how 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 e easy do you do you have in your observation have you found people actually from previous generation willing to actually step back and, 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 and let the next generation have their freedom? I think one of the key things is perception and, and the way we all become institutionalised and the way that we think. And I think particularly about opportunity and the way in which and, and what opportunities are available to us. People form perceptions. We can't do that. There's no market for it. There's no opportunity. People won't buy in that way. And I think, and I think that has to be challenged. Because that may well be right, but equally it may be wrong. And there may be opportunity where people feel there isn't opportunity. I think, I think the other piece, particularly for successors in terms of working through the process, is, is about communication and helping them to develop the narrative, which is less important where you are the principal and you are the sole decision maker, but where perhaps you have a board of trustees You've got, to, you, you've, you've got to be able to communicate 
the vision and the understanding, but not just communicate, show the confidence. And, 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 and that confidence brings um, a, a, you know, a, a level of consensus perhaps. So they, they, those are two particular areas that I, I think are a challenge. Lord Bathurst, you 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 eminent indicated you 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 took took on the the, the burden. I think in your mid twenties. I mean, did did you have a, a disruptor, a disruptive thinker like William, you know, to, to 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 challenge, or did you actually have to do the the a lot of the thinking for yourself? You, I think you've already described some of the sort of you know you, you've had tr- you had trustees in place, and you were having to mediate your ambitions through through them as decision makers. I mean, what 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 was it like when you when you did that? I think, uh, I, and as, as I've said, my son's listening on the uh, other end somewhere, I believe. And um, I think that when I took over, it's, um, it's very frustrating. Things uh, move quite slowly. You come in with new ideas. You want to do things. You can't necessarily do them. Um, my father was very you know, conservative with a small C. Um, you know, oh, we can't do that. And I find myself saying that to him as well at times, come on, look, we just must take things a little bit gently, think about what we're doing. We can't just go straight in there and do this or do that. So I think when it, it's, I do feel that sometimes the generations can can hold back the, uh, the forward movement of the estate as new ideas come on board. But I do try and make sure that I'm up with them. We must try this, we must do that. Well, what happens if it fails? Okay. Maybe it doesn't matter in the slightest little bit. You haven't lost any money. What uh, what does it do to the reputation of the estate as well? So um, you know there are all those things to be to take on board. Indeed, let's let's turn to a, a bit of, of of crystal ball gazing. Then I mean I, I for what it's worth think that we're sitting. I mean certainly generationally. I mean at, at a. a at an unprecedented period of, of, of flux, or at least we, we're beginning to start feeling it in the rural sector. We're looking out across a, in 2021, across a decade that's going to see you know, really significant change. And that's driven by all sorts of things. And, and nothing I'm about to say is, is particularly sort of profound, but I mean, that is anything from, from, from COVID um, and, and, and the home working, seeing a, you know, a, a, a sort of shift in, in people's expectations as to where they can, they can live. Um, relative to where they work, and you know, I mean, anecdotally, talk of selling agents. You know that that has had a profound effect in the last 14, 14 months in terms of of driving business. We've got um, COVID forcing a lot of um, forcing. I mean, a lot of people are, get, are actually you know putting putting pressure on going out walking, and, and that's putting pressure on the public rights of way network, and, and and going further when when the app says this is a footpath. And, it doesn't happen to be a public right of way, but off off they go down. We've got Brexit, and, and we're going to see. Yeah, we started to see from the first of January to twenty twenty one down to tapering down to nothing in twenty twenty eight. Subsidy, as we recognised it, is going out the window, and in comes the environmental land management scheme. And my sense is that the sort of the markets for for, for carbon and for you know for making good use of green space um, for your own benefit in development and and for that and others is 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 really starting to take off. But I mean, I, I'm going to ask 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 all, all three of the other panelists. So, firstly, looking into your crystal balls, what do you think is going to the big, be the biggest drive? And I haven't mentioned climate change, unless I, I, anyone thinks I haven't thought about it. But you know, looking into your crystal balls, what do you think is going to be the biggest driver driver of change? And what do you think is going to be the biggest driver of, of, of financial growth? For estates, so Victoria. Well, <clears throat> there are, there are obviously opportunities in the world of biodiversity net gain and in carbon markets. The carbon market, although it exists, is 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 it's a it's a slightly premature child at the moment, and it's quite hard for. Um, estates and farms and land managers to really understand how that carbon market is going to work out for them over the next 15, 20, 30 years. And I think there are two crucial aspects to that that we see at the moment. Um, One of them is that it's quite possible that the market price will go up considerably for carbon. So it might be the case that the early adopter uh, gets um, stuck with a quite a low price for their carbon uh, credit, but also um, it's a bit complicated if you sold uh, all of your sequestered carbon to Qantas 
and it turns out that you need it yourself. So if you're actually farming on your estate as well, uh, and, it, and the pressure comes to, um, to actually count your own carbon and, and, and mitigate your own carbon output, it might be rather unfortunate if you sold it at a low price and you have to buy it at a high price. So I, I think that that's one market which everybody is looking at like a, a bird with a worm. Um, and, and, but the biodiversity is a more, I think it's really hard for people to understand how fragile and complex ecologies are. It is not going to be easy to rebuild our fragile ecologies. It's going to be complex. It's going to take a lot of work. And some of the steps in the right direction with the tree policy, uh, the English tree action plan are in the right direction, but there are huge problems there. We have no skilled workforce to come and plant our trees. And I understand from a meeting I was at the other day, they've just taken kind of practical day-to-day -day tree planting skills rather than silly culture degrees off the city and guilds list. So, you know, we've got these things pulling in completely direct different directions, but those are, those are two of the really interesting things. And, and then finally, there is this question about, which is just coming up the political agenda. Who should have access to the land? How should they access the land? How do we balance that access to the land with the demands and the needs of the natural world? And that again is, is, is a really hot topic and it's not black and white, it's not simple, but people don't like complex arguments. They like bilateral decisions <laughs> about things. So there's like more way more than two things. And public access, as we as we all know, is something which can certainly sort of certainly crystallise black and white views and quite strong ones. Well, at, it does. At that. It, yeah. I really do have a view that what we have to do, and this is really with my CLA hat, is find a way for our members to de-stress what is actually a very very stressful situation for a lot of people. You know, there has to be. There are ways to do that and, and organisations need to work towards less confrontation and more understanding about how we can de-stress it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an area of the law that I specialised in for, actually, I, had, I was really for the entirety of my career. I was, had dumped on me as a trainee a, a very big public rights way case that ran for about sort of 11, 12 years with, with RAM as a sort of pitch battle, as it were. But it, I mean... I've, I've certainly been thinking about that. And there are, you know, there are some very, very entrenched views. But we can do probably more to, I mean, this is me wearing my CLA hat as well, actually. I mean, you know, we, can, we can do more to, to, change, to change views, helpfully, on our side than we can necessarily on, on, if you like, the other side of the argument. But, I mean, actually, the, the persuasive case for, for, for permissive access and maybe the... the, the, the the way in which it is persuasive is actually is just the public voting with their feet, um, you know, in a sense, rather rather than having to, to persuade those who, who are approaching the argument with a, with a lot of of political baggage and a lot of very old political baggage is, is, is the way forward. And I think it, you know, in part one's one's seen quite a lot of that happening in, in the last sort of 12, um, 12, 15 months or so. William, just coming back to my, my question, what's the biggest biggest driver of change you identify? And, and is that the same as something that's going to drive growth for estates? I, I think I, I'd quite like to just link back with an earlier question that you, that you asked in relation to what does 2022 and beyond hmm. mean? And I think, I think 2022 and beyond is going to give us some fascinating feedback the, the consumers and the consumers that are being exposed to our product in the countryside and the, for all the broad church of things that we that we all do, the consumers are going to tell us how good we are at it. Because actually, if that awareness exists, if, if people are engaged and people are tempted, they will come back. Now, they may change their characteristics in the way in which they engage with that product. We see it in the, um, the short-term stay um, accommodation where, where people are... Are, are, are more um, um, in, 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 in taking in take, in te in taking more numerous breaks than taking longer longer breaks. In natural capital um, and the whole environmental, I agree with Victoria. It's very early on the carbon piece. 
think where is the short-term opportunity in that sector? I think it's biodiversity net gain. Um, and I think that biodiversity net gain will be, the opportunities will be regional. They will certainly be opportunities where local authorities um, are, are willing participants and, and, and indeed where there is potentially quite sizable housing growth going on. So some will benefit from that, others <coughs> will have less of an opportunity. But I think the, 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 the broader shift that I see in the sector, which I think is unbelievably exciting, and this was happening pre-pandemic, there's no doubt about that, is the growing awareness of the value of the countryside. And if I can put to one side just for a second, the, 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 the obvious issues and the contentions around access and, and, and how we protect and nurture and uh, um, uh, develop the, uh, our, our environment and reinstall our environments as we all wish to do. But the awareness of the public around physical well-being, around mental health mm. and, and around space and, and, and I think that that awareness has, has, has given, a, given the public a new lens in which they look, look at, the, at the countryside. So where do I see that great opportunity? Yes, there are specific areas, but I think actually the great, the great opportunity is the widening of our customer base. And it's, and it's up to us to service that customer base. But boy, is it an opportunity. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've, I've been... I mean, as, I mean, Victoria knows I've sat on on various CLA committees for quite a long time, and and, and the idea of public benefit for public goods, which is you know un underpinning the, the the environmental land management scheme as a subsidy. I mean, this is a, a subset, I guess, of, of what you're you're saying. But it, I've 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 been you know trying to work out actually how how secure politically that is as a, as, a, as a sort of, you know, as a new type of subsidy, how easily you know, will it be squeezed down in terms of the absolute numbers by the Treasury? And what's, what, I, what I have had as sort of, you know, like anxiety about this, is just sort of thinking it through is, is have we made enough of the case to the, to, to the voting public and, and there is sufficient sort of sympathy and wide enough understanding of that idea of public benefit for public goods. And I think actually, you know, the acceleration of what you'd observed pre-COVID, William, might actually mean that, that again, they've, they've sort of voted with their feet and they've come to realise that to a degree. And I think they will continue to, 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 to do that or we will continue to realise that. But I think that is, you know, that, that, the, 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 the experience of the last 15 months has certainly reinforced I think in a small island, how, how how easily available a lot of rather wonderful things are at fairly you know in, in fairly short distances. I mean, coming to coming on to to to, to elms. I mean, I, I've been trying to. I had a conversation once every sort of three or four weeks with a, with a friend who's a farmer up in North Northumberland, and along with Mark Bridgman, he's he's in. The, I think he's one of one of the one of the the landowners in in the big twenty three burns pilot scheme for elms which is which is on the north northumberland coast and it's a fabulous really collaborative effort um and i and i you know try to get as i've got tried to get a sense over the last couple of years how, how sort of how, how far advanced in their thinking using this and other pilots sort of defra has got and he's occasionally gives me the anecdotal so well they came back and they asked us a lot more questions and gave us another sort of coffee morning with a with some very good bacon sardines and sort of said you tell us how to write this and you know, there was a bit more information, which was, I think, disclosed or was, 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 was put out by DEFRA in early March. And we've now got sort of a sense of, of di different, um, different tiers, if you like, of sustainable farming incentive, um, local nature recovery, and then landscape recovery. But there's not a lot of detail around Elms yet. I mean, so let me put it to you, Lord Bath, first. I mean, looking ahead, you're, you know, one sees this change in subsidy in the current one is, is, is dwindling to nothing in 2028. Have you seen enough that is sufficiently concrete from DEFRA that you would actually start making decisions which involve, I mean, in expenditure of, of, of your money um, in trying to anticipate and trying to sort of work out where, what will unlock that scheme? Or is it all just, you know, at the moment too unclear? Bluntly, no. <laughs> That's what you were, you were looking for the short question. No, I was, I was, and I was fishing slightly for that, that answer. We have not seen anything like enough. We have no idea as to what we're going to get paid for or whether we're going to get paid for things like veteran oak trees, which are already there in the ground, or permissive access. Are we going to get paid for permissive access, which we created 
maybe many years ago or just recently. And there are all these questions coming forward. But I think that climate change is going to be our biggest uh, driver. Um, it's going to cause a lot of problems as well, whether that's through gas central heating, but it's going to also give us a lot of opportunities to come through. But that's going to be a driver for almost everything. Um, as far as the public access goes, I think that we have got to learn how to live with and manage public access and um, don't see them as uh, um, sort of troublemakers coming across the countryside, see them as walking wallets. And we've got to learn as to how to extract money out of them. Now, whether that's through good old basic cream tea or the bacon butty that you've just mentioned, there are opportunities to take money off people. And people are looking to spend money and have more leisure time. And they very often want to be entertained, not um, just be left to, do, to wander. They want to be entertained in some way or another. And uh, we had a fantastic exhibition of, sort of dinosaurs and um, not live ones, obviously, uh, pandas, polar bears, etc., all made out of fiberglass mm. in the park. A huge success with the children over uh, Easter bank holiday weekend and going on. Um, it's so simple to do in many ways, um, but yet people were being entertained. And if you entertain those young children, then um, you know, that's where the, the money is. I'll come back to that, I think, in a, a moment in, in terms of, of placemaking, if you like. But I think, I mean, Victoria, am I, am I being slightly unfair to DEFRA? Or, I mean, we're putting your CLA hat firmly on here. Or you, you will have a, a clearer view than, than, than I will have, just, just simply as, as sort of someone who, 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 you know, who does go and look fairly closely. But you, you talk, to the, talk to the ministers, your, your, your advisors talk to their advisors. I... I, I... You know, there, let's try to, for the sake of having the other hat on, uh, uh, um, what, what is positive that's coming out of it? Re regardless of whether you voted in or voted out, uh, one of the things that came out of Brexit was that we uh, get to organise our own agricultural policy for the first time in decades. And um, so I suppose what we have to do is make that an opportunity. And it was definitely uh, our view that there was no particular public appetite for continuing to pay landowners merely to own land. And it, 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 was, it, it might have made all kinds of sense about where you put money into the system to bring food prices down, but it made no sense whatsoever in the red top newspapers. So paying public payment for public goods was something that we advocated from the start. I think if we were still in Europe, this is something the common agricultural policy is struggling with now. Uh, it'll struggle with it longer than us, obviously, because it's a great big unwieldy uh, organisation and we're smaller and more agile. And Wales and Scotland should be even smaller and more agile than we are in, in this respect. It is quite hard. I'm trying to be generous about it. It is quite hard to reinvent the wheel. Um, so the, but everything is always happening slightly too slowly. And, and maybe um, we were always saying um, to Devra, you know, farmers are making long-term plans. Land managers are making long-term plans. It's no good telling me in September what I need to have ready for the following May because it's just too late. So, um, and, and, the few standards that have come out um, haven't quite been backed up. There, are, there aren't standards in the pilots for um, uplands and, and there is quite an outcry about that. Yeah. I don't think, I remember right at the beginning of this process, a, a very well-known um, uh, farm manager of a very large estate said, I'm going to be asking a lot of people a lot of very expensive advice about this. And I'm going to put my finger in the air now and say, it's going to be about 50%. And I'm going to be interested to look at the end and think whether, uh, you know, everybody wasted their money on all that consultation because it turns out to be about 50%. Um, and that's going to be hard. And it's going to throw up a lot of complicated situations. Um, maybe for your listeners, it, it'll be of interest as well in the landlord and tenant um, relationships. I think that, that that'll be a, a pinch point that we're going to have to work quite hard on. And before we come on to our first question from John Hoy, I just wanted William to ask the sort of similar question. I mean, in terms of those you are advising, if they sort of say to you, look, you know, the, the concept of Elms has been fleshed out. We've got a sort of an idea, you know, permissive access might be something which you could take a punt on. 
because it actually might help to you know to to, to add what to what you're doing and bring people in. But is there anything else that that is that you you know that one can be doing now, which 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 is which is a sort of reasonable bet with your money in anticipation of of, of the subsidy being more fully explained? It's not an area of particular specialisation. What for me, but what what I would say is. I think during this period, which Lord Bathurst and Victoria have quite rightly talked about, which is a, a sort of a, a holding period until we know a bit more. I think, don't sit on your hands. What can you be doing at the moment? And I think that the, the big thing you should be doing at the moment is understanding what you've got. And, and, and I think a lot of our clients, particularly from the environmental perspective, are, are looking at or are undertaking what we call, and people will probably be very familiar with, a baseline survey to understand what their environmental credentials are. And I think building that knowledge base for now will help you to react a little bit quicker um, to the opportunities as, 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 as they emerge. But I think it's also a very sensible investment in terms of knowing what you have, because I think that very much informs where you can let people go. Um, Victoria mentioned earlier on about the, the, the difficulty and the sensitivity of, of, of properly um, regenerating, whether it's regenerative farming or, or, or whether it's um, um, improving heathland um, or, or close canopy woodland. But I think, so I think information is, not, is, 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 is power, knowledge is power. So I think that that is certainly something that people should be considering but I think also that the, the benefit of knowing where your sen the sensitive areas, if you like, are from an environmental, it also starts to inform you in terms of what else you can use for other, for, for, for other things. And I think, you know, yesterday I was at well, I had the pleasure of going to Wild Ken Hill on the West Norfolk coast. Um, and, and what, you know, what an absolutely fantastic um, in, in environmental project that is. And, you know, they are a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of what, what they're doing there. Um, and, and, and they are, they, you know, they really are forward thinking, certainly in the, in, in the way that they're farming. But what they clearly are in a position to, to, to understand is, is what potentially could come next. So they are in a position to be able to start, uh, to, 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 to have that first mover advantage. Indeed. And... I mean, coming on to the first question, I mean, I, I, Hannah, have you have have you have we got John John un, un, unmuted and, and ready to ask his his, yes, his question, I, which puts it much better than I could have put it. Yes, I believe John's ready. James, hi, good evening, and um, very interesting to hear the discussions from the panel, which have been um, very enlightening. Um, I've been very fortunate since um, Sarah Sester trained me so brilliantly to work in a number of wonderful estates through my career. Um, and I think landed estates today have a hugely growing involvement in placemaking, particularly for their local communities. And it's vital that they embrace that opportunity as the landed estates are there for multiple generations. So it's vital that they get it right, because if they get it wrong, they're going to be looking at it for a very long time. So building those new relationships and debunking the sort of them and us position, which has existed or did exist for many years is absolutely vital. And I know Lord Bathurst talked a little bit about um, his relationship and, and with Sorencester, but I would just be interested in the panel's views on the, the, the whole placemaking role for landed estates going forward. Thank you. Let's, let's start with Victoria. Well, Placemaking in its broadest sense it, it, it is about, I think is it sort of follows on from what James has just said, it's making a very complex assessment of the assets that you have in trust in a very, with a small T, and, and seeing how that can benefit everybody. And, and it sometimes it's, it might seem obvious that access, and, and I'm sorry to keep coming back to it, is, is, the, is the clearest way that perhaps you could benefit people. But there are other ways that the community um, can benefit from what you're doing on your land, whether it's, you know, um, sequestering carbon or how it sits in its community. There's all kinds of complex ways that we can, we can do these placemaking exercises. Um, I think that 
you have to be where the community is not just the people who live at the end and that sounds very elitist doesn't it at the end of the drive but you know it, it's it's not your immediate geographical community we have a separate community that comes to Cornwall that's terribly loyal every year to enjoy their holidays here how do how do we really benefit them and yet protect the thing that they come here every year to see and so I, I think it is useful. And just quickly looking at the, uh, you know, um, that benchmarking, that baselining uh, that we were talking about um, just now, I think that is the vital part and actually deeply fascinating. Yeah. Actually sitting down and making a big list of, of, of what you have to uh, contribute in every way to your community is, is, is a useful and exciting thing to do. And you both persuaded me wearing my trustee hat to, 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 to do that on at least one estate. I think where actually it, it, it does it does start start to capture what we've got and, and potential opportunity. I think we have a question from Charles Bridgman. Um, Victoria, nice to see you. I've just come back from Camborne. Um, I've diversified the estate over the years and I'm honestly getting to the stage where I'm beginning to, to scratch my head because um, even though we've diversified, it's very hard to maintain income uh, at a reasonable level. I think we're running at about 0.5 of a percent return. Um, but my biggest concern is that um, I still don't think that the government, uh, and particularly DEFRA, have a real understanding of the job that we do. That combined with uh, a tax regime, which is inimical to forestry and to uh, letting properties. Um, do you think there is any chance that we can actually get the government to go for um, uh, the CLA concept of, of, uh, of a single business? Um, yes, I think we, this, is, this is the idea that the CLA has been promoting at Westminster of a, a rural business unit, uh, at least so that we don't have to produce tax returns for, for all of our separate diversified businesses, uh, uh, making everybody, including uh, our accountants and bookkeepers' lives, a complete misery. So, yes, it used to be that um, the Treasury said that it was a ridiculous idea and, and, and nobody could possibly condone it. Uh, and then it, everybody has slightly warmed up to it. It's quite popular with uh, politicians on both sides, actually, uh, at the moment. So um, the Rural Business Unit is an area uh, to, to, to watch. I have to ask whether you were going up Camborne Hill or coming down, but um, and presumably you were there looking at mines, because that's what they do in Camborne. Um, Lots of people would say we have the most benevolent tax regime for 100 years. So uh, I, 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 it feels painful, but um, I remember um, income tax rates a good deal higher. I think that's, that is, I mean, that's one of the points that I nearly steered, steered everyone towards earlier on, actually, was, was actually if, if, if you, you, I suppose, look, look, look through, through where we've got, what we have been through to get to where we are at the moment in terms of perhaps the last, I suppose, the last sort of 30, 40 years of, of political and legislative history. I mean, it's, it's, it's been you know, a, a, a move to a more benign tax position um, than, than was the case in, in, the, in the 70s. We've seen property leg legislation, for the most part, has, has 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 followed, I suppose, the trends of the 1980s. I mean, one thinks about landlord and tenant um, relations, both 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 in the, I suppose, in terms of, of residential, but also in terms of of, of agricultural and the, the Agricultural Tenancies Act 1995. I suppose what we have seen with the residential, you know, the high point of, of, of free, free market um, landlord and tenant relationships was 1996 with the, the introduction of the short, short old tenancy and, and, and the, free, the freedom to get repossessed, you know, to, to, to seek repossession has been, I suppose, steadily eroded, if I can put it in political terms or, or circumscribed, if I can describe it as a lawyer. So it, it, it's, it, it strikes me that actually, e even if there are some difficulties such as that, you know, the perennial question whether um, 
you know, with agricultural property relief is going to going to get it in the neck. Um, you know, is 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 is, is there? But I, I I'm hopeful. I think, given where we're starting from in terms of, of of sort of legislation and politics, it could be an awful lot worse. I think our next question is going to be um, from. And forgive me whilst I'm just trying to work my way through this. Is, is Harry Harry on? Are you are you ready to? Harry should just ready to speak. Harry, do you want to fire away? Oh, okay. Let's see whether I can. Because very kindly, everyone had been had, had tabled written questions. So what I'm going to try and do is is very quickly go back. To, the, the, the questions that was put in writing is for the next generation of estate successors. It can feel more of a burden rather than a joy and privilege. Wealth taxes, inheritance tax, uncertainty in agriculture. And do the panellists have any advice and encouragement for those taking estates on? I mean, Lord Bathurst, what would you have said to yourself, age 26? I suppose I saw it as being a challenge and something that uh, I had trained for through uh, uh, Y College, London University, and then through the Agricultural University, uh, land agency, and something that I wanted to take on. I took it look, looking at it as a challenge. And I'm delighted to see my son keep being keen and wanting to uh, follow in my footsteps. So whether they're the right footsteps or not, it's another question. Um, but it, it is going to be daunting. It's not going to be easy. But again, First World War, Second World War, are we going to face something as dramatic as that? Um, we'll find a way through. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, Victoria, I mean, there's, there, there is another issue, I suppose, which, which is, 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 is perhaps next to that. And I know it's something I've sat, sat um, around the table at Belgrave Square with, with you and with others talking about, but actually, you know, there is no easy answer to it. And, and I suppose it's probably more agriculture rather than the wider rural sector, but which is how, how one does create the opportunity to actually get yeah, I, mean, a, I mean, a good, solid stream of younger people coming into taking on farming. And I suppose the most recent thing we've seen is the golden, you know, the proposed golden handshake, which is being either being consulted on or the consultation from DEFRO is just finishing in terms of the, the, the subsidy runoff. But I mean, do you think from that point of view that, that, that is in, enough is being done both by government, but I suppose also by the CLA, NFU, and, and, and other 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 organisations, which are member organisations, to um, you know to, to try and try and, and, and address that that sort of that, the, the, the 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 sort of generation issue almost from that point of view. It's 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 not. Uh, uh, there's a logjam of mm. exciting young people and excited young people who want to come into agriculture. The, the, the revolution of regenerative agriculture is upon us. Uh, you know, they have gurus in people like Gabe Brown in the American Midwest. Uh, and the people who are coming into, they feel rightly, deeply excited about that. But to the wider question that Harry asked, I, I think you should try to shape what you do to the life you want to live. Don't shape it to a life that you hate and make yourself uh, unhappy. And for goodness sake, don't expect to get rich. You know, expect the life to be the, the, the answer to what you want, because I, I don't think there, you might be, you might be the one in the million who comes up with the cunning plan, but actually it's, it's shaping it to the life you want to live and having the enormous pleasure of, of, of living, uh, you know, in, in a rural open space is a good, and doing interesting work every single day you get up, you have a bit of breakfast, and what you do for the rest of the day is interesting. That that is a reward in itself. I'm going to. I think. I think actually that needs leads very neatly onto. Um, I suppose our, our next question, which which I'm hoping will come from John John Wibley, if he's if he's uh, un, unmuted and uh, and available to ask the question. And if he's not, I will. Um, I very happily ask it for him, which is, how do you maintain, we've touched on this, I suppose, how do you maintain enjoyment of state ownership beyond, beyond second-guessing future responsibilities? I suppose beyond second-guessing future responsibilities is, 
I suppose is a sort of I suppose a synonym, perhaps sort of chasing chase chasing ideas and, and, and things coming short. But I mean, William, you you've stressed that, and I've seen it on so many occasions. The the, mill, the millstone round the neck, but it's the sort mm. of the millstone that actually you know, is, is is your 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 own millstone. How how do you? I mean, we talked earlier on about about how, how you might approach sitting down perhaps with, with two people in the late 30s. I mean, it's, you know, it's a similar conversation with the late 30s or late 40s. But, but if, you, if, you, if you're, you're having, you know, sort of the conversation with somebody who is 58, who has been doing this for 20 years, who, you know, it's a big part of their, 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 their DNA and their identity, and it's what they've been doing, and they couldn't countenance doing anything else. But actually, you know, it, it is all getting a bit much. It's, you know, they, they are looking sort of angst-ridden glum, what do you say? How do you actually, and, and, and sorry, not just what do you say, but actually how do, you, how do you get them in that situation to somewhere where they can enjoy what they're doing? I think the answer lies in listening and, 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 and helping to encourage people, you know, even, even if, you know, they in the 40s, 50s, 60s, to to understand that it, you know it's 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 not too late, and that actually what are the things that you really enjoy? I mean, mm. what Victoria has been saying is absolutely central, I think. To to, 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 to uh, but but that's quite easy to say, isn't it? But I I, th I think that a lot of estates have for many years focused their attention on a landlord and tenant relationship, and I think as Diversification has happen, happened across the United Kingdom. What we are now seeing is a much greater um, trading opportunity for estates, yeah. but for the first time trading, but not where they have necessarily the operational responsibility. So often people are constrained in terms of what they really want to do because they just don't feel they've got the, the expertise to be able to do it. And I think, and I think that, that has changed significantly. And I've just seen over the last two or three years the sort of the, the scale of the recruitment market and as people in leisure, tour, tourism, hospitality, mm -hmm. And I'm talking about sort of general managers, for example, who, who, who know what they're doing and know how to run these enterprises. They are available. They are, they are keen to work with um, new enterprises, existing enterprises. So I, th I, I, I think it's, it's, it's sort of getting people to, again, challenge perception, but within very much that definition of, 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 of what is going to work for you because you know diversification in the rural sector is, is, is really a phenomenon for the majority in the last 15 years something something like that it's still a relatively infant um, market marketplace and there are many that have diversified decades ago but I think I, I, I think that you know that that marketplace has has shifted things in a way that people should be encouraged to try and challenge their 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 thinking and and the ways in which particularly they deliver their opportunities, whether that's generating capital or whether that's that's generating revenue. William, thank you. And I think we have a question from Simeon. Hello, can everyone hear me? We can hear Hello. you perfectly. Hello. Great. Thank you for the useful talk so far. I had a quick question. How does an estate uh, normally reach out to foreign investors? Um, and I'm asking from the point of view of trying to increase, uh, let's say the financial growth of the estate as a whole, we were talking about a return of 0.5% in some examples, but then also uh, just to get ideas from outside of English and UK borders to improve the way the estate is run. Thank you. William, do you do you have experience of, of of actually having those conversations in either direction? I think that one insight that I would share is the level of overseas investment in um, our leisure sector, and it's very interesting to see 
um, the level of transactions that have been going on in terms of um, farm parks, for example, um, visitor attractions that have been um, have been acquired over the last last eighteen months, um, and and a number of these companies see great opportunity in the United Kingdom. Um, and I think that it goes back to what one of the panelists saying earlier on about people, people want experiences, they want to do things when they, when they come. And I think that the UK leisure, the leisure sector, um, to some extent, is, on, is, is a little bit behind the times in terms of the way in which the, 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 the global leisure market operates and, and engaging with the consumers. So I think there is real appetite for um, acquisition, but also joint venture, because ultimately, our, our estates hold the the, the, the land based and and the place, um, and, and these people have the expertise. And I think I think those opportunities of of, of working with um, uh, not just overseas but um, UK based investors as well um, is, is is greater now than I've certainly seen in my my twenty years. It wouldn't be something I, I mean I, I claim expertise in, but, but I mean I, I think I cer certainly say this that I mean actually if what one is one's investing in two things if one isn't I suppose buying buying the land I mean Williams Williams point that actually you know the the, the, the business of estates is actually you know hanging on to the freehold ownership for 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 the, for the long term but you are still if you're investing in a land based business in this country taking a punt on the fact that actually you know the way in which land is you know is, is sort of regulated as a as a, as, as an asset is 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 you know, transparent, fair, clear, and actually, you know, from from a lawyer's point of view, um, from from you know, when I have had comparative views of of the way in which other other countries deal with with property law, particularly when you put in public controls like planning and constraints on what they, you can do with your property, it's 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 you know, it, I, I, it's a good place to in, invest. I, I think I think undoubtedly, and I think you know that 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 won't change. That certainly won't change. Joe, you've got a question, I think. I have a quick comment, actually, and a question, if that's right. And I'll try and be quick because I'm conscious of time. But I think that um, it was mentioned earlier about, you know, getting more people into the sector. But something that struck me is that the government is very, very interested in developing local skills and local productivity. And I think there's a key piece of great messaging around what some of the estates are doing, particularly as the number of people being employed on some of the estates is going up as the diversification goes up, in actually working very closely with the LEPs in terms of trying to develop those skills agendas. And it's all part of the messaging about what the states can do, as I say, because of the tourism go up. I mean, a desperate shortage of skills, and it could then help to bring more young people into the sectors, particularly if there's a land-based college in the area where the estates can work with a land-based college, get young people into the estates and do partnership working with the colleges. So it was just a comment. But I also wanted to pick up on what Victoria said, was that, I, I mean, I'm interested in actually what your thoughts are, you and Alan really, about showcasing sustainable agriculture through the estates because you can take a long-term view and there's so many amazing examples and I mean is the CLA taking that approach in terms of messaging what you're doing for example with long-term research projects because the UK could be leading in this area simply because of the way that we we manage our land and as you say it's a way of attracting the best and the bright brains to the sector as well but also it's also part of you know, something which is very long, you know, valuable in the long term? Um, I think that uh, just, I'm going to quickly jump in, but I think uh, on, on uh, something that's been raised already, which is the pilot scheme called 23 Burns, which was a, a pilot scheme for the ELM project done by the president, uh, Mark Bridgman, and a lot, a lot of farms in his area in North Northumberland. And I think, that will, those are the kinds of um, projects which really do showcase not just what estates do, but what estates and farms do and what farm clusters can achieve and what farm super clusters can achieve. But I think it's quite a good idea to get away from the idea of estates and, and, and into the world of land management and collaborative 
land management. One message that we, I, I push out, and I think we're pushing out all of the time, is to keep reminding DEFRA that it's not just NGOs and that can deliver these new ELM projects. There are these wonderful collections and farms, and sometimes single estates, and sometimes collections of large estates, which will be able to deliver um, uh, nature recovery uh, in a way and showcase it uh, to the world. So I, um, and everybody, we're always pushing people to get ministers to go and visit farms. They have to go and buy wellies first, of course. <laughs> but, but, but I was thinking that collaboratively so much could be done that biodiversity area where it's so complicated, as you say, in the carbon story, because working together, it'll be easier to navigate it, presumably. It's, it's, what's, it's upscaling that's the, the difficult thing. But even if you put us all together onto, into one carbon, wonderful credit offer, <laughs> the pension funds would sneer at us. So we do have to find ways of putting these things together and making them sellable, making them scalable. Uh, but it's, it, it's I, I think we have a really strong story to tell about the contribution that the countryside can make, uh, you know, for the future. But it's important to remember that all estates um, have to be sustainable and in the true form of that, that means financially stable and uh, sustainable as well. And it's all very well talking about uh, regenerative agriculture and various other forms. But unless there is some money coming out of it at the end of the day, then uh, it's not going to be sustainable. I think that the timing is absolutely perfect and bang on quarter past seven. And on that very realistic note, and on Victoria's very, 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 very sort of upbeat and positive note, I mean, I, I take away from this discussion that, that there is going to be, there is flux, and we're seeing it already, and there is going to be a great deal more flux, but there is a huge amount of opportunity. Um, and there is a huge amount of opportunity for, I mean, for, for, for those who are engaged in land management and, and running these businesses, those of us who actually, you know, who, 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 who from a professional standpoint, hope to bring some value to those who are, that, who are our clients. And actually, there's an enormous opportunity for the British public to actually come and enjoy the British countryside. Um, and there's an awful lot that is, that is going, to, going to draw, um, draw them to it. So I want to thank uh, the Royal Agricultural University for, for, for playing host this evening um, and for, for putting on this, this, this for, for us, has been a very fun panel debate to participate in. To thank Victoria, to thank Lord Bathurst and to thank William. And on that note, I'll say goodnight. Thank you very much. Thank you.